Okay, next speaker is uh, uh, Reinhard Kau. Uh, he's going to talk on how computations enter in mathematical fund foundations. Yeah. Thank you very much um, to the organizers for, for giving me the opportunity to speak here. In fact, Douglas asked me um, to suggest a topic and I sent him uh, three proposals, two more technical ones, but then I said maybe um, you're also interested in a more relaxing, um, historical, <laughs> philosophical topic which could be given at the end of a long and hard day where a lot of technical results were already discussed. And in fact, he chose just that one you find here. What I will present you I mean, are results which I assume you all know. I just want to stress a little bit, let's say, the, the philosophical impact of some known results with respect to how do we see today mathematical foundations, um, in particular in the context of Hilbert's program, and what computations uh, <coughs> play as a role. It's not so much constructive in the um, yeah, more narrow sense, but um, yeah, let me start with one result um, we all know. Uh, Tarski theorem in a sloppy formulation says that arithmetical truth is not defined. In fact, what's sloppy here, yeah, we should maybe say better what we actually mean by definable. And if we explicate it in this way, it's not recursively definable, well, then it might be a little bit redundant because definability should include some kind of notion of recursiveness. But um, let it as it be. Um, technically, I will assume here church thesis and identify computable with recursive. Um, and I think that's a constructivist and still another step um, we can maybe discuss. Um, later the deception. <laughs> so, um, yeah, there were one point, uh, let's go, how did um, uh, computations enter? Yeah, exactly by this recursive, and I could stop here, but I want to go a little bit more into the details, in particular um, from the historical context. So, let's go back uh, in a moment. Uh, 150 years, and if you ever looked a little bit to the historical context, you probably know that Konig and Dirichlet had already quarreled concerning computational and abstract reasoning in mathematics. And um, then Hilbert aggravated this quarrel with the non constructive proof of his basis theorem of the solution of Wagen's problem, and there's this famous citation of Paul, Paul Gordon that's not mathematics, that's theology. Mm. Now, from the perspective, I mean, Hillel was well aware of the problem, and let's say, of his reasoning, and he, he was a good part of his paper on the uh, computational, or the missing computational content of his proof, and later on, I mean, he uh, tried to give constructive versions of his proof also. But at the same time, um, he found in Cantor's set theory a paradise, as he and later for modern mathematics, where we can develop everything as we want in the sense of Hilbert. Well, we you know that I mean, not everybody agreed on that, but even Hilbert himself uh, noticed that this paradise was represented by the set theoretical paradoxes. Mm -hmm. And so there's a very interesting um, marginal in some lecture notes of Hilbert we just asked around 1905, why is the totality of all sets not permissible? Why is the set of all real numbers a permissible collection? And actually, I think this is still a good point today to ask a student I mean, who wants to enter foundations, I mean, what, what are the answers to this? I mean, if you take set theory, the answer, I mean, Semino Franco, I mean, that um, the totality of all sets is just not possible to, to be defined, but I mean, it definitely doesn't answer the question why. Okay. Um, now, we know that Hilbert had a quite original way out of this problem, actually. Uh, he were wanting to secure mathematical reasoning um, by performing consistency proofs. 
And so they came in two steps, formalizing mathematical reasonings, the proofs, and then in a second showing that no formalized proof can end in a false formula, but it's a slow Also here it's interesting, um, if you look historically, I mean, Bauer didn't question this program. He actually said, I mean, he might have success with that, but it does not provide meaning. Consistency doesn't imply meaning. So the point, I mean, there was <coughs> cross-talking about what actually would be achieved by that, but actually by this kind of criticism, they were never answered. So he were really after this. And um, we highlight here the question of consistency, but one has to say that that was only one so a central goal of his investigation. And I mean, we see, for instance, that formalizing mathematical reasoning is completely independent of um, question of consistency proves that it's something which we do today quite successfully, completely independent. But it's not so clear whether we would do it if we would not have started this business. Um, because in many of the uh, aspects of formalization grow our the proofs in real world, conceived for his program. Okay. Now, um, I found an interesting note. Oh, no, yeah, let's say, uh, was it saying? There, there are other goals, and there's a talk now, more than 100 years ago, he gave it Zurich uh, on axiomatic thinking, where's a detailed list of additional aims, including questions like simplicity of proofs, which were never ever addressed, but uh, <coughs> also the relation of contentness and um, formal, uh, you know, uh, inhaltlichkeit and formal. Uh, I don't want to say the point, but okay. Um, now, concerning consistency, Kreisel conveyed a very nice um, remembrance of Bernays. So according to Bernays, Hilbert was asked if his claims for the ideal of consistency should be taken literally. In his then usual style, he laughed at him that the claim served only to attract the attention of mathematicians to the potential of proof theory. So, I mean, and that's actually what we do today, where we do proof theory, we, don't, we should not do it because of consistency. Proofs, I mean, that is not our central question, but because it is an attractive area also for mathematicians to investigate um, proofs or formal proofs um, for other purposes, um, <laughs> if not consistency. Okay. Um, now, the implementation of this program led to the invention of proof theory as a new discipline in the emerging field of mathematical logic, but Goethe's second incomplete in theory. <coughs> Theorem shows that this program cannot be excluded, but executed in the original intended way, and then with some interpretation also. The first one would be the theorem, or like if some more, um, for what Hilbert could achieve with it. Um, here's not the place to discuss the fate of Hilbert's program in, in the light of Goethe's result. Instead, we have to point to a particular successful side of the Hilbert's program that was what I already said the formalization of mathematics, which can be consider completely independent of the question of consistency. Now, just various uh, <coughs> most of the proponents should be known to you. I mean, formalization of mathematics in some sense, I mean, if you want it goes back to Euclid in some way, but okay, the really progress we find in Uhl and Schroeder in the algebra of logic, but they didn't have quantifiers, so it were a flege, who did the major step by introducing quantifiers. Um, then we, you all know White and Russell, um, which when they developed a quite big um, a, uh, treasure of, of formalization of mathematics. Um, but in fact, modern axiomatization of first order logic as we know it is due to Bernays, I mean, he was not completely happy with the quantifiers um, presented in, in Whitehead and Russell, and he wrote it up as we know it today, and it was published in Hilbert Ackermann's seminal textbook, Wunsubide Theoretische Logik, but it's due to Bernays, even if it's not really mentioned there. Now, on the side of, of first order logic, obviously Hilbert himself, as you can see it in his own writings, it was a big part of his motivation. I mean, came up with the new maximization of geometry in good luck the geometry, which I mean are sometimes overlooked in some historical context for the motivations of Hilbert. I mean, that preceded his work on, on, on formal logic. 
Um, then we have, of course, already slightly before Peano and Dedekind, which um, were giving the modern axiomatization of arithmetic, but which is very important, they gave it in a higher order context. So you, you don't find the Peano axioms as we know that today in Peano, because we include the recursive definition of plus and times, which I mean, are derived by Peano uh, based on, on higher order. <coughs> mm. And then, I mean, Hilbert himself was the one who gave us the modern axiomatization of analysis, even that a second order arithmetic. Also, that is often not stressed. And um, if you have popular representations or representations of his 24 pro uh, 23 problems, uh, it's said the second problem, the, the headline reads um, consistency of arithmetic. But if you read the text, it's about analysis because arithmetic was. For Hilbert in 1900, probably at least that is what it's like, second order arithmetic. Um, yeah, so that's what I just said. So the analysis second order arithmetic, and this uh, should be really read as um, second order arithmetic, which means analysis. <coughs> okay, and then um, with Cermedo, we eventually got the formalization of set theory, um, in fact, developed. Uh, when he was a postdoc, as we would say, in the uh, inverting and underhand. Okay, so I think that's all known, but um, now, how good were these formalizations? I mean, this, if, if you look to Hilbert and Ackermann's textbook, I mean, we use some kind of other symbols at some point, but it's more or less literally what we use today. Still, there's one point which is puzzling if you look into the work of the Hilbert School in the 20s. So there were a famous or ill-famous paper, PhD thesis by Ackermann in 25 on the uh, yeah, foundation of the Tacit Nodato. So it's PhD thesis where he were uh, supposedly proving the consistency of the Tacit Nodato on the base of yeah, some kind of intuitionistic work. <laughs> mathematics, uh, we all know that didn't work, there was a gap. Um, but it's quite interesting how Ackermann introduced formal systems. So um, he says, to the once and for all fixed axioms, and that are the axioms, let's say, for propositional logic, uh, quantifier logic, one can add axioms to define functions. When stating these axioms, some arbitrariness is permitted. How many of such axioms one is using? Of course, in each proof figure, it can be only finitely many, and which shape they have is left to arbitrariness. It's the willkür überlassen in German. So this is, I mean, a quite way, way of defining a formal system. And but that was the standard in the 20s. Now, there's a, I left out one line, which is interesting. Uh, of course, he was aware that we cannot define functions in a completely arbitrary way. So what he says, all these functions will be defined by recursion. So he did not <coughs> specify what kind of system he, he has. But he says, OK, you can somehow um, on the fly introduce recursive functions. Now today, I mean, I think I have that here on the slide. So in a modern sense, Ackermann does not even define properly his calculus. The idea might be clear, but as his work is a formalistic enterprise, one would expect <laughs> some more vegetarian. And <coughs> one would say a modern axiomatization of PRR would most likely serve. Uh, but uh, how do we define PRR today? Uh, well, we just plug in the defining equations of all primitive because of functions. But then, for instance, we have already an infinite external system, something they didn't like by that time. So it was more this kind of flexible one. I mean, of course, he stressed here that I should not start to have proof figures which use infinitely many axioms. So that's uh, uh, not what they have in mind. But he would say, what are the axioms can be decided in the moment? Anyway, some of our little stretch. OK. Excuse me, this function here referred to number theoretic function? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. definitely number theoretic function. So this is not analysis. This is. Um, now, um, what well, my point is, and some of the first conclusions um, I want to, to sell you here. So, so how do you do the <coughs> axiomatization of PR? Well, 
It requires an external algorithm to generate the axioms for the primitive recursive functions. And they are not given by a scheme. And let's say, as Ackermann, before he even, let's say, says here, we, we need a notion of recursion, and then we can conclude that recursion precedes axiomatization. So, I mean, even for the Hilbert School, it was a more fundamental concept which I would have had at hand before I can start axiomatizing something. So that's uh, one <coughs> of the points I wanted to point out from the historical perspective here. But let's go on. Um, oh, yeah, a, a small interplay. If you are familiar with the work of Paul Finzner, so he wrote in 1926 a paper formal proofs and the decidability, and he had believed to have had anticipated Gödel's result. And in fact, you find this paper, which is a little bit obscure, um, well, it's not much a sideshow, it's not <coughs> in my mind, but um, it was included by Van Heinot in the cinema collection from Friedrich to Gödel, so you can, it's really accessible today uh, in English. Now, um, and there, there is a published correspondence Fitzler and, and Gödel now the collection. And Fitzler was really upset that uh, Gödel didn't mention him or let's say that it was not appreciated that he had it. And so now read, that's your homework, read Fitzler's paper and decide whether he anticipated Gödel or not. And then he did that, I mean, if not, say exactly why. And so my experience is the following. Um, so Gödel obviously wrote for a lot, still it's not easy to pinpoint an error in Pinsler's paper, and why? I mean, he is hopelessly informal in his argumentation, and it's really hard, let's say, to say, oh, here's something wrong, no, I mean, it's rooted in this Ackermann style, I mean, the, 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 maybe you need here another axiom or something like that. Um, in fact, it's maybe not as bad. I mean, the arguments is the continuum side of the data, but so there is, it's not a bad paper, but it does not have the same formal um, character like Gödel's paper, and that was something which Barth, T.S. Barth told me that Kaiser pointed out that one of the most important impacts of Gödel's paper was that it set new previously unknown standards of formal legal. And that's, I think, plainly true. And even if you look to Hilbert and, and Ackermann, maybe Bernays had, had some yeah. um, uh, standards. But let's say we all, I mean, we are all on the shoulders of <coughs> Gödel, so I mean, we are used to these standards which were simply not existing before 1930. But wait, wait, Principia Mathematica. <coughs> no, I mean, Principia Mathematica is just a, I mean, a, a string of symbols. But that, that is not formal rigor, I would say, in the way Gödel is doing it. Because, uh, I mean, if you look, let's say, I mean, it has to do, of course, that they try to encode all ma um, mathematical objects in logical terms, but then it becomes unreadable. Uh, uh, <coughs> and if we have non logical axioms, we can do better. And I think, let's say, that's, that's a better way. But the new uh, techniques of Gödel, Gödelization, was it also used by Fitzler? No, 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 no. It's a, no, it, it, exactly. A technique like that is missing. But about utilization, I don't know whether I have it. I mean, Bernays, he even writes it in, in the second volume of Code Like the Mathematik. They were thinking of it, but they, they saw, I mean, you could not achieve anything with it. Um, but of course, they were looking for the positive result, where Gödel were using it for the negative result. Um, okay. Um, and let's say, but it, just look, I mean, how much we use Gödel's techniques today, and I mean, who tried to use um, Whitehead Russell directly, and nobody worked in that system. And there's still this other question, which is in the system and about the system, because I think Russell even yeah, yeah, uh, thought it's true. impossible to make state the meta statements. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, but let me continue with Gödel, and I'll tell you what I would call the recursive turn. Um, it's known that Goethe was not sure about the ultimate significance of his result for Hilbert's program. And in the original paper, he still wrote, it is, should be expressively noted that theorem 11, the second incomplete theorem, is in no way, uh, in no way contradicts Hilbert's formalistic standpoint, for the latter uh, presupposes only the existence of a consistency proof carried out by finitary methods, 
and it is conceivable that there might be planetary proof <coughs> of the deep visibility. And so on, he was not sure about that. But then, um, later on, I mean, when he learned about Turing's work, he uh, changed his mind. So uh, this, I have not the original citations so you can get out of some papers from Google in the uh, correspondence with Nagel and somehow in this post, but he did to the English translation of this paper, I think, in uh, uh, Martin Nagel's uh, collection. So Google himself remarked that he, it was largely to its work, in particular the precise and unquestional adequate definition of the notion of formal system given in Turing 1937, which convinced him that his incomplete theorem being fully general field refuted the Hilbert problem. And um, so, in consequence, and was just a, a sort of observation, the mainstream research in mathematical logic, notable by um, around Church and Princeton, is cleaning a central figure turn from proof theory to recursion theory, if not to model theory with fast work. And you can actually, I mean, I was puzzled a little bit what happened to proof theory after Gödel. I mean, of course, Berna is Finnish, Grundlage der Mathematik, which was only published in German, and I mean, it's an excellent book. But in some sense, let's say in the 40s, you don't find so many, I mean, original proof theoretic papers, because it sort of turns more to recursion theory uh, on the one side and model theory uh, on the other side. Um, okay, but I want to make another point about Gödel's incompleteness theorem, in particular with respect to Hilbert. I mean, we can safely assume that Hilbert never ever fully grasped Gödel's incompleteness theorem. I mean, uh, it was uh, Presented in 1930, in some way in 1931, it was uh, published, and then there were immediately a correspondence with Bernays, who clearly understood it, but Hilbert was already old, and uh, only a few years later, when he had Alzheimer and was not really um, commenting any longer on it. But there's one point um, which I realized, I mean, it's not stressed sufficiently a corollary of Gerd's first incompleteness theory, which, I mean, it's immediate, it's not stressed by me. I don't know, if you give a logic course and discuss Gödel's um, incompleteness theorem, maybe you mention it, not everybody, but let's say some kind of folklore result. Second order logic is not axiomatizable, he recursively axiomatizable. Yeah. And the proof um, is, I mean, immediately if you have um, the, the category key result from, from Dedekind, um, then something has to go wrong with Gödel's. Incompleteness <coughs> can only be that second order logic is not exercised. So when somebody noted it, and in fact it was Gödel himself who noted that, uh, he has it in his manuscript for his talk in Königsberg in 1930. We don't know whether he read the full manuscript, but I mean, it's on record. And um, now the point with Hilbert is that he had second and maybe even higher order logic in mind, as I said. I mean, analysis was seen as second order arithmetic. And you can even find it in print if you compare the two editions of Hilbert Ackermann from 1928, that's the first one, 38, it's the second. So the opening, chapter, uh, the opening section of chapter four in the first edition is entitled Necessity of an Extension of the Calculus. Notwendigkeit einer Erweiterung des Kalkuls. It's clearly said, okay, we propose here an maximization of first order logic, in our function calcul, and they were not knowing whether it was complete, but Gödel answered that is in his dissertation. And then they added, but okay, uh, even if this first one is complete, then it's necessary to have something more for second order logic. But I mean, then there are some general considerations, but not even a proposal is given. Well, and then ten years later, the title was changed, <coughs> and the non is about of second order logic is mentioned with explicit reference to Gödel's theory, but uh, without the proof. But I mean, 38, they were knowing exactly what was going on and that there's no hope for um, an axiomatization of second order logic any longer. And, well, I don't know, there are some, well, good question. Several people which are older than me, but I mean, at least my generation grew up with first order logic. Mother <coughs> Milk, and you cannot even imagine something else. Nobody asked. Seriously, let's say uh, what's going on in second order logic because I mean 
one knows it doesn't work, so let's forget about it. But maybe we forget about it too early. That's the question. So, I mean, yeah, just to recall it, piano arithmetic has a finite second order axiomatization, and let's say, as I said before, finiteness of the axiomatization was in all times in the 20s one of the characteristics of a good axiomatization. Uh, and it's a non trivial but for the result that first order piano arithmetic cannot be finitely axiomatized. Uh, and also one which I didn't find any, any proof of proof, but it's for the floor. So, in fact, in many cases, first order axiomatization of mathematical areas require non finite axiomatizations, and that's no problem for us today because we know that's the reality. But at that time, um, let's say around the 30s, it was seen to be something not so good. And, um, <coughs> okay, now, um, um, let's look for a trivial complete axiomatization of arithmetic inequalities. So you all know the structure of the first order structure of the natural numbers with the standard satisfiability relation. Now the complete zero is just one which takes all two arithmetic centers as axioms. I mean so um, quite good the problem is um, the task you are already good the zero imply that the set of excerpts of T is not recursive. And now, um, so for that reason, the name axiomatization, the term, should mean recursively axiomatizable. I you don't know whether this is absolutely um, agreed that axiomatizability includes recursiveness, but um, it should. Um, so, but it's hard to ensure the meaningfulness of the derivability relation, the recursive number of the axiom is turned into a key condition. I and mean, otherwise, we don't have any notion of proof. Uh, so now let's come to the key question. Do you believe in the structure of the natural numbers? Um, I mean, there are people which do not believe in it. Um, I hope not here. <laughs> but um, every platonistically trained mathematician believes in it. Um, but there's one point, of course, why, why mathematicians don't care about it. Well, they know in any case that it can be formalized in semi-dual fatal set theory. So believing in semi-dual fatal set theory commits you to believe uh, in these kind of structures. And, and that's, for me, the explanation why mathematicians don't care about foundational questions any longer because they say, okay, if you have a problem, speak with the set series, but then it's somehow outsourced to set series. Um, and but there's a, 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 a made a good remark on this. The clear description of segments of the cumulative hierarchy of sets has done more for the removal of genuine doubts than all finitist consistency proofs put together. So I mean if the question of consistency comes, I mean as long as you believe in the cumulative hierarchy of sets, I mean, you, you barely can, I mean, deny the consistency of, of arithmetic. And so most of the mathematicians are doing that. I mean, for instance, I mean, you can read that in a paper of Feferman, who claims not to be a Platonist in a strong sense, but he says he has a quite good intuition about the cumulative hierarchy of sets, so I mean, he has no problems um, with consistency. Okay, mm, now, but one has to admit you don't need to believe in models of the ZFC in the same way uh, you should believe in the standard structure of the natural numbers. I mean, then models of serial fatal sets, that is another issue. And, and uh, uh, foundational discussions can still start. But um, the point is that I started with the first order structure of the natural numbers, but here also the second order structure of the natural numbers. And that's something, yeah, you can find it in some textbook address that was uh, the last chapter, and it's something which is lost, so to speak, as a, as a topic we, we investigate. Now, um, recalling first order series, I mean, the, 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 the ironic point is that set of series is first order series, <coughs> which might be a little bit surprising at the very beginning, but because of that, I mean, and with the fact that we can formalize kind of structures in it, we are happy with first order in mathematics. But Semino Summer against this uh, scholarism, as he called it, um, the any kind of first order restriction, 
And here comes the second thing I want to sell to you. Um, a comment of Bernays in 1938 in a discussion with Kohler. So, and when I said the axiomatic restriction of the notion of set to first order logic does not prevent one from obtaining all the usual theorems of Cantorian set theory. Nevertheless, one must observe that this way of making the notion of set or whatever predicate precise as a consequence of another kind. The interpretation of the system is no longer necessarily unique. <coughs> it is to be observed that the impossibility of characterizing the finite with respect to the infinite comes from the restrictiveness of the first order formalism. The impossibility of characterizing the denominator with respect to the non-denominator in a sense that it's in some way unconditional. Does this reveal, one might wonder, a certain inadequacy of the method under discussion here, which is first order logic, for making axiomatizations precise? So, and he was well aware, quite late, um, he still wrote papers, or short papers, three or four pages on stopping limit of axiomatizations, where he were clearly saying, okay, I mean, we are living in this first order world, but maybe that is not sufficient for, I mean, mathematics as a whole. And in fact, um, I mean, this was a discussion, I think the original um, uh, record is in French and was published in the 40s in a Swiss, uh, Swiss uh, journal, so it's not very accessible. <coughs> and there's a faint echo of this in Kreisel's um, plea for informal rigor where he actually also said, I mean, maybe we should take into account second-order properties, and people are just, I mean, not any longer used to it <coughs> because of that. Now, mm, to sum up, so Gödel's theorem tells us that there's no recursive theory that, uh, which captures the uh, <coughs> structure of the natural numbers. Uh, by its very definition, the reliability has to be a recursive relation, otherwise, I mean, we, we lose completely control, and so how computations enter it. Yeah, proofs are finite, axiomatizations are recursive, if not finite. This condition is due to the limitation of first order logic, but as a conclusion, we cannot do that. Thank you. Of the geometry by Hilbert was mm -hmm. not first order. Yeah, uh, actually, that's. Uh, uh, I mean, so Hilbert was not first order, even yeah. uh, um, That was one of the points um, which, in fact, Bernard stressed later that for him, it's one of the results that geometry is different from, from arithmetic. And let's say it's a new realm mm -hmm. where, which he were wanting to see separate. We today, I mean, take the reduction to the analysis. I want to have it, but uh, you are quite right. I mean, uh, Hilbert, I said, by no means, I mean, he didn't have a chance to comment on first order as at least as, as nothing. And there's the one thing, uh, when you consider a constructive type theory of uh, Martinov, mm -hmm. is it recursive or finite? Uh, yeah, it's mm -hmm. it's yeah. recursive. It's recursive. Yeah, it's not finite, but it's recursive. I, I thought for the finite uh, well, look, most things are schema. Schema? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But to, my, but to my mind, it hardly makes a difference. I mean, it's because we are used to it. Yeah, I mean, the point of my course, I said that originally, if you look to Piano, the original maximization, I mean, it's finite because, I mean, all schemas are just given as, a, as one formula in, in second order. Say. Of course, we are used to it. Yeah, sure, sure. If, if one schema is one, if, if one schema counts as one, then then it's fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the clear schema. <laughs> yeah. uh, you consider uh, the direction where the computation uh, came into the foundational. Mm -hmm. Discussion and in short, as far as I uh, un understood your uh, comments, uh, that means recursiveness. When does recursiveness uh, come into uh, the foundational uh, 
uh, discussion. But what about uh, the uh, reverse uh, direction? Uh, from your point of view, when uh, did uh, uh, um, computation uh, influence, uh, when did the foundations influence the computation? That means the way in the others, in the other direction. And when did it start? The, and it's this because of John, or let's say when the people were realizing that they need the notion of recursiveness before. I mean, the Ackermann function I mean, was found in Göttingen in context of developing the Hilbert's program. And so, I mean, we know that Gödel, in Europe, writing up his paper, was <coughs> developing the first notion of recursive function. Mm. But first, there's also an interesting thing, is that for them it was absolutely fundamental that functions are total. They had no concept of partial function, and he reports, even funny, that at some point Gödel took him aside and asked him, what is a partial function? Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, for me, for instance, conceptually, partial functions really help to understand what's going on. But Martin Leff, um rejected it um, vividly and says, I mean, he wants to know what's, like, what's going on, and he needs the totality of a function as a, as a fundamental property. But I think it's this recursive term that, I mean, when Gödel realized that, I mean, he has to fix better what it <coughs> can be a proof system, I mean, you were needing a better notion of recursiveness, or let's say a foundation for it, for it and found it in, in, in Turing's justification. Mm -hmm. uh, did uh, did uh, uh, Gödel uh, realize the uh, importance of uh, uh, Turing's uh, result for uh, computer science, what we later on call uh, computer science? Actually, about computer science, I don't know. There were even something else, I mean, with Gödel, I, also not so familiar. I, I asked in Zurich about Gamma, mm -hmm. because in Zurich they had one of the first computers uh, Suse, there, and they had this um, Bundeshauser, mm -hmm. uh, one of the first computer scientists, I mean, next to Bernays. But apparently, Bundeshauser and Bernays never spoke with each other, and Bernays had no real interest in computers, and they had no real interest in them. That's very interesting for modern developments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the historical point of Leibniz, and the Gill was influenced by hearing Brouwer in Vienna. Uh, I can't remember whether it was 26 or 28. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I don't remember Finsler's paper from uh, the von Heiner, the, the volume. Uh, do you know whether he was in any way influenced by Brouwer? I'm just curious. Finsler, I'm sorry. Um, good question. I think not directly. I mean, he had interest in, in, in foundational questions independently. I think at that time he was even a professor here in Köln, close by. Um, but not, let's say, within the, the intersinistic. Um, okay. I mean, it was more about set theory than um, in general. And I mean, the paradox is set theory. So he had some interest, but he has some some feelings <coughs> of non well founded sets. Um, Where did he publish his paper? I'm not sure, Mathematische Zeitschrift or even Mathematische Analyse. Standard Mathematical Analyse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the last one. So, yeah, I have a question. So, from what I understand, when I, so Keeney, when he started realizability, he thought about maybe using other notations than natural numbers. Yeah. And uh, Gödel told him, no, it's good, you, you use natural numbers, there is a recursion theory, and so on. And it, uh, to me, I, I think it, I mean, to me, yeah, I think it, it kind of delayed uh, the natural connection we would see today between proof theory and realizability mm -hmm. functions. And so I was wondering what you would have to say about that. Well, I mean, that's just what I said with that recursive term. I think that was where. Exactly, yes. Yeah, yeah. Which is, I mean, um, where realizability is one of the. Um, offsprings we have today, out of all the actions the people did at that time. But, I mean, there, there are some papers by Kleene and by Church about early times of recursion yes. theory, where, as far as I remember, realizability is not particularly stressed. I mean, there was, of course, when the Lambda calculus was completely independent for that, even before that. Yeah, but, but yeah. today we would, we would yeah. typically do realizability on top of the Lambda calculus. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think that Kleene had this kind of intuitions, and Gödel said, no, 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 no. 
Turing, Turing is like the numbers are more concrete, but, but Kleene was restricted to numbers realizing mm -hmm. uh, uh, propositions, and uh, there is a, a machine number realizing it. Uh -huh. But uh, Gödel, I think, uh, was inspired by the idea of uh, the computational functionals, mm -hmm. which are realizing uh, the proposition that there seems to be a difference. <coughs> Okay, so uh, we will continue for our discussion during the reception. So let's just keep on.